Welcome to Resilience Rock Sales, your front row seat to rocking your sales game. I'm your host, Stacey Kopas. Today's episode is brought to you by the Academy of Resilience Inner Circle. For more information, head to academyofresilience.com.au. Now on with the show. Hello and welcome to another episode of Resilience Rocks Sales. Today, I am joined by my good friend, Joe Marku, and Joe is actually the first person I ever spoke to about this podcast quite a while ago and agreed to be a guest, even when it was a totally different iteration of the idea. So I am so excited to finally get to have a conversation with you today, Joe. I am so proud of you, Stacey, for following through on the idea and taking it. And I've been, I've been watching you posting about it, and all of a sudden there's people that are signing on they're your guests you had great guests already so congratulations thank congratulations. you so it's wonderful to watch and you're the resilience person i mean you you're living proof so it's it's an honor to be here because resilience you need it in sales because it's not always sunshine and rainbows no it's i i've never heard sunshine and rainbows and sales in the same sentence before so there's something in that. I'm glad you're seeing it pop up. And it's one of those things. It's easy to talk about ideas. It's one of those ideas are easy. It's the execution that's the hard part, isn't it? So right. um, it feels good to be well underway with having these amazing conversations. And yeah, the conversations so far have been fantastic. And I'm, I know that you're going to have just such a wealth of tips and inspiration and insights for our audience. So to kick us off, what I'd love is just if you could share the Joe story with us. So the Joe story, yeah. How did I arrive here? I'm known as the sales sensei. It's been an honor to be called that. And as such, I didn't give myself the title. Somebody else did, and then it stuck. And it's been over 35 years that I've been providing people the opportunity to learn what I call the ability to handle objections through buying conversations. And there's been an evolution in sales. So I started off in fitness equipment retail, setting up people in for their home or their gyms or corporate wellness and fitness. And I started that at the age of 18. And I opened up my very own store at the age of 20. And by the age, of, yeah, and by the age of 25, I did a merger with a company where we were the seventh location in Canada. And a year and a half later, we had from seven to 38 locations. So we scaled very quickly. And what I learned at that was how to obviously set up systems, how to really be able to negotiate the buying conversation. Now, I left that company because the alignment wasn't there for me. And alignment, something's really important. It's got to feel good so that I can have the right mindset so that I can continue to work my skill set. And the alignment wasn't there because people will see, and, and more importantly, they'll feel it from you when it doesn't feel right something's off. And the, what I like to say, when the picture and the sound don't match, no, it doesn't work. And sometimes it's difficult to put your finger on it. And yet people, when they're really in tune or they're aligned, they'll go with their gut. And so from there, I worked as a representative in the fitness side, connected to the bicycle industry. In 2007, I wrote a book called Boutique Thinking in a Big Box World. And that started my public speaking career. Doing small business consulting and coaching. We'll fast forward all the way to the pandemic. Right before the pandemic, I was visiting small businesses throughout primarily the United States and Canada. I was traveling a little bit to Europe. And because of the small business nature, I was a one-on-one. -on -one. I was an army of one. And I have a program in our portal for our members called the Army of One Sales Training Program. The thing is, is there was no way for me to be able to scale. And because of the pandemic, I had to come home to Winnipeg, Canada. And through our mutual friend, Craig Ballantyne, I, he asked me, he said, what's your, because you can't travel and you can't earn now, Joe, what's your favorite thing to teach? I said, oh, it's the SOS by far. It's my favorite thing, which stands for the sales objection system. And he said, well, we got to turn that into an online program. And, and I turned it into an online academy where people come and meet live and we practice handling objections. and. If I asked you, Stacey, and if I asked the listener or viewer the same thing, when someone gives you an objection, whose problem is it really? Is it theirs or is it yours? Mm. 
I guess it's a little bit of column A and a little bit of column B. Mm-hmm. And, the, and that's the challenge. Most people, it's, objections are normal, regardless of the price. And I'm a big believer in high ticket. Nonetheless, regardless of the price, objections are normal. And how we perceive our program or our offer, our product or service is usually one of strong belief. Stacy, do you believe in your public speaking? Do you believe in your program that you offer to people? Yeah, 100%. 100%. So when yeah. somebody challenges you on that, how does that make you feel? Your emotional response is, what do you mean it's too expensive? Or how can, how can you not afford to do this, right? That's the emotional response. And that's the trap. The trap is when you believe in your, your heart and soul, because of course, everybody says, I don't want to be pushy and I only want to sell what I believe in. So if you believe in it and somebody resists, when emotions go up, intelligence goes, goes down. down. So this is where people end up saying things to really nice guests or what I, some people call prospects. I like to call them guests. So it's just, it's akin to the idea of, Say you're in a relationship with someone, Stacey, and you love them very much and you're having a conversation and it turns into a debate and then the emotions get higher and then the, the, the debate turns into an argument and then all of a sudden it's an all-out fight and you say something that you regret. I'll be the first person to say that that's happened to me more than once in my lifetime. Has that ever happened to you, Stacey? Uh, guilty. <laughs> this happens to people during sales conversations. They don't want to be pushy, and yet they can see that they can solve the problem. They get an objection. They don't know how to, they don't know what to say. And more importantly, they don't know how to say it. And that's the challenge because 93% of the way that we communicate is a combination of tone and body language. And in this world of Zoom, this is a perfect platform to practice body language and tone. Your face tells the story. So if somebody is not authentic, we can see it in your eyes. Mm -hmm. I can hear it in your voice. And a lot of people don't practice this. They just say, well, Joe, what do I say? What do I say when they say I need to speak to my partner? I need to speak to my spouse. I can give you all the words. That's 7% of the solution. If you really want to influence people, if you want to be persuasive without being manipulative, to really have being that, I'm, I'm going to be the authority. As opposed to people can be passive and yeah, take my card, call me when you're ready and they'll ghost you. Mm -hmm. Or you could be aggressive and then it turns people off. Or you can find somewhere that you're in your own space, wherever you're truly you, where Stacey can be authentic and assertive. And assertive is not aggressive. Assertive is, hey, I'm going to be the coach here and I need to help you. So let's do this. I just love what you've created with that because it's it's something where it, it does take that practice and the reps and absolutely being able to bounce back and forth with people in a space where there's nothing at risk. Right. The secret sauce. Yeah. The secret sauce, Stacey, is actually doing it with someone who it, well, we have different tiers. So we have a black belt all the time leading the group. And so I just did a speaking engagement not two weeks ago in Nashville. And what was interesting was these are all business owners that I was speaking to. And within 30 seconds of pairing them up in groups of two to do the exercise, within 30 seconds, half of the, the room was talking about, so where are you going to dinner tonight? What did you do last night? What hotel are you staying at? And I had to stop the room and go, okay, this is why we do it this way. And then I would bring volunteers up and they would do it with me. And everybody was paying attention because obviously the accountability keeps them on target. Because if you train a white belt with a white belt, you create bad habits. If you train a white belt and you train them with a black belt, the black belt is going to mentor them and they're going to accelerate the process to get to a black belt. And what's interesting is when you really want to master something, you teach it. Which is why everyone who's a black belt in the community has first been a member of the community to learn it. And now they teach it. And that's how I've grown the business. And tell us a bit about the growth, because I know from our last conversation, there's been some incredible growth over the last few years, like just from yeah. 
this is the you know adjustment. I was going to say that P word, but we don't say the P word after the last right. few years. So we're not using the P word. So the adjustment. The new opportunity. Yes, yeah, so definitely a new opportunity. So from that, and obviously that's a very, very different angle than what you had been doing up until then. So yeah. from there to where you are now, I'd love to hear a little bit about what was the process in which from going from, again, that idea to three years later, where, right. where you are now. Yeah. I mean, to think, of, I started as an army of one doing it online and, and starting off with one session a week, then two sessions, then six sessions, then nine sessions, and then eventually going to a point where I could not do all these sessions myself. Getting people through the, what I call a gamification process, where they would earn their black belt, then they would sh I would shadow them get to a point where they were more than good enough to teach it. And what's interesting is when you start to teach this information to others, what do you think happens to your own sales and your own business growth? Oh, they're going to go up for sure. It's, it's insane. Yeah. It's honestly insane. So what happened was I went all the way back to, okay, how am I going to market this? I went through all of my old email lists. I'm talking all the way back to my AOL email addresses. And I emailed everybody I possibly could. And I had 44 people show up, old friends from high school to university to all of it. And, and they stuck it out. I made a presentation and I had two people sign up right then. And, then. and that's how the sales objection system dojo began. And, the, and a dojo, just if, if anybody's not really sure, a dojo is in martial arts it's a safe place to make mistakes. It's a safe place to learn. And it's a studio. The, the difference is we do it on Zoom. And it's a place where you can come and learn from people that have more experience so they can accelerate the learning process for you and time collapse it. So rather than taking years, you can literally do it in weeks or months, depending on what level you want to reach. And then, of course, the real training begins when you become a black belt. Because then it's all the intricacies of also catching other people to do it right. Yeah. Yeah. It's been, it's been a wonderful journey. So in three years, I went from an army of one to now having a team of 30. Yeah. And I'm having fun. I'm having so much fun. And that's the important part, isn't it? Because there's a lot of people talk about scaling and it's like, and it, and the whole thing is it's like this perception that you, yeah. you have to scale, but it's like scaling is not for everybody. And no, it's not. And that's the thing is, but the way, and, and if you can scale in a way that you can maximize your impact, your income and have fun along the way, then that's where it's at, isn't and, it? And it, it is. And to say that there weren't and aren't some scary moments, there are. I, I remember hiring somebody for full time and suddenly it's okay. This person wanted six figures and I didn't. What goes through my mind at that particular moment, I think back of it, it's like, well, I don't have six figures in the bank. And it's like, well, you don't need six figures in the bank to be able to do this, right? How do we create the cash flow so that it justifies everything and we continue to grow the business and we add more? And, and it's exactly what we've been able to do. And that doesn't mean that I don't have some months where I have certain expectations that we don't hit. And then some months where it was like out of nowhere, where, how did that happen? So it's been a roller coaster of a journey that requires resilience. There's mm. no doubt about it. That's it. And that's, that's a, those, those scary moments. But what would you say? Was there at any point that you sort of thought, my gosh, I'd probably better off going back to doing things the old way? Did you have any of those moments that? Not. I love it. The answer to that is no. I did not want to, after the shift in the globe, the globe, I was forced to do things this way. I still enjoy travel. I was traveling, Stacy. I was traveling 144 to 160 days a year Ouch. away, away from family um, and away from my wife. Away, it's just, and, and that's the 144 was what I was booked for 2020. And when I think of it, that's like, 70 to 100 flights. It's a lot of airport time. I don't mind spending time in an airport. I don't mind spending time if I'm going to a, an event. And that's what I'm doing now. I'm essentially, tr I now get to pick and choose because now I can do this from here. I can honestly, as you're watching me in my home office tomorrow morning, 
I'm able to do this from my cottage where we have perfect internet access and I can still do it from there. So when I'm done for the day, I can go to the end of the dock and I can, you know, throw a line out or hop in the boat and go fishing. And these are, so I can, I get to Im immediately decompress as opposed to being in the city. So I wouldn't trade it for the world. I am very blessed and I know it, by the way. So I'll pick my spots to travel if there's an opportunity. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's nice to be able to have that discernment, isn't it? Rather than going, okay, well, I just need to say yes to everything that's there. And from a, from a leadership perspective, because I think we're going to have, we have a lot of sales leaders that are listening. So obviously there's been a lot of leadership that's involved in as you've scaled and bringing on that team. What are some of the things that you've learned about being able to lead a, you know, a high-performing sales team when you're doing everything remotely? We would, yeah, I, I, this, is, this is very poignant. So there are certain people that I will meet with daily, and sometimes it's just a huddle. And that's my, more my higher tier team. I have a monthly meeting with all of the black belts. So we'll do this the first Wednesday of every month. And it's just a catch up, just to make sure everybody's on point, what our goals are, and if we've made any changes. Um, I also make a point of looking at our numbers and then sharing that with the team. I think it's important as well. I'll come in and I'll, I'll ask for feedback and I'll listen to the feedback before I make a decision. And sometimes people come to me with proposals and I'll make a point of going in and I'm not going to make a decision on this until tomorrow. It's mm -hmm. just so I can reflect. Again, from a leadership perspective to hear it, because a lot of my team members have great ideas and it doesn't necessarily mean that we we're in the right position to be able to execute those at the moment based on what we're doing right now. So yeah, Mondays are, are heavy meeting days. And then what we typically, at least for me, as my leadership style goes, it will typically decrease my amount of meetings throughout the week so that I have more white space. And I've had to learn more and more, and I'm still working on it, letting go, giving, giving tasks to people. And I'll ask my own team members, what are some of the things that you want to be able to take on? And then if, the, and some, it's, it's wonderful because some, sometimes people want to do things that I don't want to do. And so Great. So if I gave you these tasks to do and they get more fulfillment from it and it allows me to do more of the things that I want to do. And the more white space I get gives me the opportunity to come on podcasts, go do some speaking, do, you know, writing more books, writing my daily cup of Joe emails. And these, because these things take time. So yeah, the, the leadership piece, I've learned a lot from you. It's been it's been wonderful to follow you on LinkedIn. If you're not following Stacy on LinkedIn, like follow her on LinkedIn. Yeah, it's great content. That was a different an unpaid plug. And thank you. And that's a really good tip about the front loading the week with the with the meetings and stuff like that. I, I know personally I'm still trying to work out what my flow is with that type of stuff. And at the moment I'm sort of front loading my week with interviews and doing those type of things mm. as well. And and also you know, looking at it's interesting trying to juggle the calendar, particularly in, in Europe as well. You're working across time zones, so right. you now it's trying to find okay, where's my energy at its best for particular things, but where I, I do need to make myself accessible for people that are in North America. And then later in the day, for me, it's like okay, so for today, I've got another one at first one at 10 a.m., last one 5 p.m. with someone in the right. UK, so. And then also doing the interviews like this for the podcast, but then also being interviewed for other people's right. and media and stuff like that. But yeah, it's trying to work out. Well, again, and but it's a constant, is it that test, measure and iterate, isn't it? Just being wedded to a system, but giving it a good chance to work. And the other one I just love that, I, that you said there is it's actually going back to the team and asking them what, what would they like to take on? Yeah. And, and that just gives so much permission, doesn't it, for them to actually say, you know what, I'd like to have a go at this or I'd like to have a go at that. And then there's other people that are just like, I'm just happy doing what I'm doing. Sure. And there's nothing wrong with that. I think it's great that I can give people the opportunity to shine. Sometimes I've been surprised. In other, in other times, I've been shocked that somebody's asked to take on a task where I'm not too sure. So we will give just a little 
a piece of it and they prove themselves and it's like, by all means, go. Or I'm kind of glad we gave that a test, right? Because had we given you full reign, we might have had you know a, a serious issue here. And sometimes that's as little as social media posting or as big as, hey, I'm going to be the warm up act at your next speaking engagement. So, you know, people have to prove themselves so that, hey, if you, if you have what it takes, then let's go with it. Cause there's nothing I want more than for people to say, I want to be in Shannon's dojo or Leah's dojo or Jeff's or Rusty's dojo. Like instead of saying, I need to be in Joe Marcoux's dojo, they're saying, I want to be in this part. It's, it's so wonderful. Because what does it do? It frees my time up. And I know that my team are doing such a wonderful job. And then that gives you the ability to scale, doesn't it? Yeah. And you, you mentioned earlier, scaling didn't really come to mind for me at first because I was an army of one. And I could have easily said, you know, I'm going to do five dojos a week, one a day. That's it. There's going to be so many people involved in it, make a nice beautiful lifestyle. And I would have accomplished that within six months. What ended up happening was the mission, well, the vision of the company is, is that, and just so that you know, and I'm going to look at it, to be the world's best producer of confident communicators. Beautiful. I'm not suggesting that we're going to be the biggest. We want to be known as the world's best. And so if we do that, well, then we get people knocking on the door saying, hey, I've heard from you. I've heard about you from, I've heard about... Because our marketing is primarily referral based. It's all organic. Somebody sees me speak at an event and then it's, I, I want to hear about this. And they hear me on a podcast and they want to, they want to learn more. And then we give people the option. Hey, just for fun, come in and try it. Costs you nothing. Come and experience it. And then they see it. Then they experience it. They feel it for themselves. And that's the difference. And that's really with, with sales. It's easy to just watch a video, read a book, and not get the benefits from it. This was the problem that I had as this traveling one-armed, one-man one band. I would show up, I would play, and then I would leave. And people would just go right back into their old habits. Mm -hmm. Now they come back, depending on the type of membership they have, either you know every other day or daily if they have an unlimited membership. Or most people, they come in once a week for an hour. So they build every week on their good habits. It's like Atomic Habits from James Clear. What do you need? You need frequency and you need repetition, which is exactly what we do. And it's, it's not dissimilar to going to the gym. That's the whole no, thing. You don't, it's exactly you, the same thing. Yeah. And it's so interesting hearing you say that because that's exactly the way that I approach resilience as well. It's, and you know, talking about rituals for resilience and that practice, it's again, say to people when I speak as well, you can't listen to a 45 minute talk or read a book and suddenly have this magical power for life. It's yeah. like, even I do these things every day, right. those building that, because it is like going to the gym. It's like you use it or lose it. The muscle atrophies if it's not used. That's and, right. and so, yeah, and it's been, and I've loved watching the way you've grown your business in that way as well, because, and I've, le I've learned a lot from it because it's a similar thing. As I said with resilience, it does take the repetition. And so it's been good to see that and going same thing. It's like, I can only give them so much in that short period of time. And some people right. will run with stuff and they'll do stuff and they'll have an impact, but it is that imagine if, the imagine if people actually had a place to come and do that on a regular basis, the impact that can be had from that, I think is, is, is amazing. So, Sales is a perishable skill. Resilience is a perishable skill. If you don't practice these things, then again, like you said, it atrophies. So it's your choice. Do you want to make mistakes on buying conversations or sales calls? Or would you like to make mistakes in a safe place where you can have quick course corrections so that when you actually get on a real live call, you have that alignment where you have confidence, you have conviction, and people are attracted that they want to buy from you as opposed to, did I just get sold mm. and have that ugly, icky feeling? Or I don't like to sell people. It's amazing how many people I meet, they go, Joe, I just don't like selling to people. And it's like, so, okay. If there was a way for us to be able to develop a conversation where people just felt compelled to want to buy from you, would that interest you? Yeah. Of course, people love buying. Of course they do. And they buy off of who? People they know, they like, they trust. And so how do I develop rapport? What can I do to 
be in alignment, inspire people, motivate them, and empower them to make a decision. Because what is sales? It's a structured conversation where the person I'm speaking with feels in alignment. We have a portion of our program that's called AIM, A-I-M-E. AIM in French, by the way, is M, and M is love. So it all makes sense. And I'm a French Canadian, so I can go there. So it's alignment, inspire, motivate, and empower. If you're not empowered, you won't decide. And what's our goal in during a buying conversation? To empower someone to decide. I would much rather hear no than a maybe. I'd much rather hear that because then I, I can move along in my calendar. Because that's the other thing, Stacey. Nobody, nobody is going to close 100% of the people 100% of the time. And if anybody claims that they can, they're lying to you. Yeah, agreed. And so talk about, as you said, sales and resilience being those perishable skills are things that we need to be doing on a consistent basis. In your experience, what is that relationship between the two? Like what what impact does resilience have in sales success from your own personal experience and also from what you're seeing in the people that are coming through your programs? I think that part of the the piece for resilience is understanding that there's a secret sauce, which is called accountability. Mentor, mentorship and having people that will help keep you motivated is all part of that mystery. And it's not a mystery. It's finding people that you can connect with so that if you do run into a sales slump, and it happens to some of the best, if you do run into a sales slump, are you recording your calls? Can you review them? And don't review, don't you review them, have them audited by someone else. Resilience is part energy. And one of the things that I tell people when it comes to sales, mm. highest energy wins. When it comes to resilience, you can't, you can't show up with low energy. It requires a high level of energy to be resilient, which understanding that I'm not going to close 100% of the people 100% of the time. Or understanding that, you know what, there are going to be people that are going to naturally resist. An objection is absolutely normal. The question is, how am I going to manage my emotions to be able to overcome the objection? Understanding that if I do a great job in discovery, I can minimize, not eliminate, minimize objections. And so with the right combination of, of that, with the right energy and what you offer in terms of resilience, because you're going to hear no. You're going to hear, even if at the best of times, I want to think about it. And if you don't know how to overcome that objection, then you're going to have to do what? Follow up. And then having to lift this thing up during a follow-up that, you know, when you have to lift up a phone, sometimes it feels like it's a thousand pounds to lift mm -hmm. up the phone and dial. That takes resilience. That's not even, that's not a sales issue. That's a resilience issue. So if you can have the resilience to be able to pick up the phone and lean into tough conversations. It's not uncommon. Stacey, have you ever had a conversation with someone where you're discovering, you're learning about what their challenges are, how it makes them feel, and that they explain it to you, they describe the pain that they're, they're in right now. And we take them from pain island and we show them that we're the bridge to pleasure island. And that we ask them, what's the future look like? Describe to me what it would feel like if... You mentioned if earlier. Mm -hmm. Imagine, and there's a sales word. We get them to imagine. It's not, un it's not uncommon for, for me to be in the middle of a conversation with some of the strongest people you'd ever meet. And you know, soft tears are rolling down their cheeks because they realize the actual amount of pain that they're in. And people are going to buy based on emotion and justify it with logic. So if I can reach that emotional space and it takes practice and it takes an understanding of leaning into the difficult conversation and I can help someone when they, they, they get it and they feel it, then it's just a question of justification. They'll justify it with logic. Then they'll make a decision and they'll feel good about it. And that's such a win, isn't it? When you mm -hmm. get, hey, both people walk apart, walk away from a situation going, I've helped to get that person closer to solving their problems. And that, the, the buyer has gone, oh my gosh, I feel like there's a weight that's yeah. been lifted. That's been lifted. Yeah. Yeah. I find it interesting too, you know, as business owners, we, and I don't get me wrong, I still measure metrics. 
it's easy to get caught up in metrics of revenue as a salesperson or what are my sales metrics. And imagine if you came from a place to, what, are, what about these three metrics? How many testimonials did I get this week? How many referrals did I get this week? How many five-star reviews did I get this week? Imagine those were your three metrics that you worked on. Logically, the rest of it would just happen because these metrics become your North Star. I'm going for reviews, referrals, and testimonials. If you do that, then obviously you're delighting customers. And, and to me, delight is really the, the key word. If I satisfy someone, well, that's okay. If I delight you, you're going to give me a testimonial. You're going to review me with five stars. You're going to refer people to me. And that's the difference. Delight is over the top. You champion of customers, right? That's, that's what we want. And that's what I encourage. It's a great way to look at it. And yeah, just, just going so far beyond. Because again, revenue doesn't tell a story. No. It's a number. Um, but right. there's so much more to it than that. And so I really love that that's the, that's the angle, as you said, in the North Star. So getting people to be focusing on that. And, and mm. also, too, it's really cool with that because you, know, most, you, you do need to ask for those things. It's oh, so yeah. unusual that someone's just going to go and automatically go and leave you a Google review or a LinkedIn recommendation or do all those things. But the act of asking that question, is so many things that come from that as well. You get, to, you get to really experience what their result is, their outcome is, but more importantly, what that feeling is that's tied to that. And then that yeah. can be so helpful, isn't it, in articulating the future conversations that you're having with, and I love that you said earlier, guests rather than prospects. And I just, right. to me, like language is such a big part of resilience and you know, the way we describe things is the way that we experience it, but also even more mm. importantly, how our guests experience things based on the language that we use and that energy. So I think if we're looking at bringing that energy, but also then bringing the really good languaging around that, like what an experience for somebody, I said, a guest to have a conversation with you and that being an experience right. rather than feeling like they're just being pitched at. So right. like, you're bringing all of those things together. It's just like, what an amazing opportunity for them. And I love this because all these little ideas are running through my mind at the moment. And if you can get yourself in the, in the mindset, you know, as a rep to go, I'm actually creating an opportunity. And it's almost like that conversation with you ends up being a gift to that person. Without question. You're going in with the intention of, okay, I'm going to go into this conversation. I'm going to make a new friend today. And if I can delight them, then I can earn the right to ask for a testimonial or ask for a review or ask for a referral. And through organic means, the numbers will simply show up. The profits will show up because we're doing these other three metrics. As opposed to if I'm focused solely on profit, I can guarantee you the alignment today the alignment would be off. The picture and the sound don't match and people pick up on it. There's a weird vibe. No. If you go in, I'm here to help you. I'm here to serve. And this is the other thing. You want to sort before you sell. Sometimes sorting in the sense of, okay, you know what? I don't know if this is going to be the right fit. And it's okay to tell somebody, I don't believe that we're going to be the right fit. And so you're saving everybody time and you could still be friends. It just based on the product, the service, the program, whatever it is that you're offering, if it is not a good fit, sort that out before you have the buying conversation. You're only going to get more respect from people from that. Sure. And also the, the level of trust yeah. comes from yeah. that. And then those people are likely then to be great sources of referrals down the track as well, because they're going to go, they didn't try and, you know, they actually gave me great advice. Right. And then they ended up with, a solution that was a great fit for them. But then if they're having a conversation with somebody they know and they're like, oh, okay, I'm in the market for, you know, objection training, whereas they were looking for more sales tactics perhaps. And you right. were able to then go, okay, well, this person's a better fit. But yeah, sometimes you go, yeah, I could do that. But just because you could doesn't mean that you should, isn't it? Right. So being able to yeah. make those distinctions. My gosh, there's so much in this. And 
I think there's, I think we're gonna have to have a, we're gonna have to have a part two at some point, Joe. Because happy to do it, Stacey. And the correlation between resilience and sales just makes all the sense in the world, from every angle: handling objections, following up, picking up the phone for the first time, asking tough questions. That's all part. That's all part of the sales process, and it's it's a buying conversation. So I, I'd love to come back. That and I'm be- so proud of you. So thank good. you. It's exciting. I'm having a lot of fun. I know you mentioned fun before. And fun is actually one of my core values as well. And so it's really nice to be able to do things where I can have these great conversations, share such valuable information and insights and inspiration with with an audience, get to introduce my community to the amazing people in my community. So I'm really excited that I get to share you with my community. Thank you so much. It's been so much fun. And one other thing I'm going to touch on, the Resilience Rocks as part of the as part of the name of the podcast. And that's, you know, resilience does rock sales. Um, mm-hmm. But also there's a resilience rocks. So the language, there's all these different rituals and all those little things that we do, the reps, they're rocks as well. But there's the rock music twist as well. And you mentioned, again, highest energy wins. So do you have a go-to song that would be the one that you would play in order to get that energy up, say before a call or any of that. Okay. What's Joe's the, the one that comes to mind right now? is Won't Get Fooled Again by The Who. I, I just love that kind. And again, that gets me going. I'll listen to, I, I'm one of those Van Halen guys that, you know, back, it, it doesn't matter who was lead singer. I just loved it all. But The Who is, is the one that comes to mind. Even Baba O'Reilly from The Who. It's just so teenage wasteland. It's just, it, it, it's not the lyrics. It's just the feel. It's just the feel. I, I, I have to feel energized and I want to come to these conversations and yet I don't want to come in too high. This is really important for people to understand as well. And I'm sure many of you are going to appreciate this. If I'm not in alignment with who I'm speaking with, let's say I come in at a level 11 and they're at a level five, I'm going to blow them away with way too much energy. So the idea is come centered on the call, definitely be prepared. I, if I need the energy, I'll go get it with music and meditation and get prepared and definitely move, like move my body. And then when, once I get on the call, if I notice that they're at a level five, I'll go to a level six and then I'll creep my volume as it were, or my levels to seven, eight, nine, ten, 10, and have them come with me with the right questions and the right process so that they get excited, they're inspired, they're motivated, and then they're empowered to do what? Decide, which is what we are charged to do. If we help people make a decision, then we help them cross the starting line. It's not the finish line. We get them started on what helps them. That is awesome. I love that. And the who, if it's not already on there, I've got a P- Resilience Rocks playlist on Spotify. If anyone oh, I love it. So I am going to go through and trawl through the list and see if I, do, if I don't already have those on, they are being added in your honor. But as soon as you mentioned the who, my brain went straight to the opening of Bubba O'Reilly because it's right. just so distinctive, it's isn't it? So and it's good. it's such such a good track, and so I'll add those on. And talking about just being the start, where can people who have listened to our conversation today start a conversation with you? Oh, I'd love it. Yeah. So if they wanna if they want to connect, you can connect with with me on LinkedIn at Joe Marcou, M-A-R-C-O-U-X, or, or on Instagram, it's at S-O-S Dojo, at S-O-S D-O-J-O, or the S-O-S Dojo.com website. And feel free to email me if you want, joe at S-O-S Dojo.com. Awesome. And I've downloaded your resource. Please share your amazing resource around objection handling that people can also get. That'd be awesome yes. to share. Absolutely. So if, if anybody's interested, I'm going to give a link to Stacey that you can take from this, this podcast and you'll get, you'll get my book. It's a brand new book that I just came out with six weeks ago. It's how to handle 26 of the toughest objections in sales. It is literally a cheat sheet that you will love. All of those toughest 26 objections all compiled with a two-step elegant system that will help you overcome them. Simple. It's beautiful. I've had it already people raving about it and I'd love to give it to you. So all you have to do is just click the link and enjoy. Amazing. Thank you so much for generously sharing that. It has been an amazing conversation. Thank you again, Joe. I look forward to 
part two as we go along. And until next time, thank you for joining Resilience Rock Sales. And in the meantime, be your best. Thanks for joining us again this week on Resilience Rock Sales. Don't just listen though, take action. The best sales professionals are always learning. Head over to resiliencerocks.com now to go backstage and get the resources mentioned today to help rock your sales goals. <laughs> <laughs>